at Luth, during which he obtained the FWACP and also um, a master's in public health. Now, not content with um, pursuing me right into Luth after med school in Ibadan. Uh, then she popped up again in the UK, um, uh, a little while after me. And she currently is a consultant neurodevelopmental pediatrician at the Queen Elizabeth II Hospital in Wellington Garden City, now approaching 20 years soon. I'll just tell you a little bit about um, Dr. Takon and why she's so qualified to deliver today's um, talk. Um, I'll give a bit of a background to her. Um, and beyond the, the study that she had undertaken in Nigeria, she then pursued. Uh, can I kind of. You are muted. I'm muted. Did you hear anything that I've said? Yeah, just the last bit. Okay, someone might have muted me. Um, I do apologize for that. So uh, I was just saying that um, uh, Dr. Leto asked me to present this session and again, the perplexity about presenting during between Christmas and the new year. Um, I was saying about Dr. Takar, who is a colleague and a friend um, who's very well equipped to deliver today's talk. Um, she is a, an experienced pediatrician um, in the UK who's got credentials across um, Nigeria as well as the UK. She's a fellow of the West African College of Physicians. She's got a master's in public health from, um, from uh, also from um, Lagos. And uh, she then came to pursue an MSc in community pediatrics um, at the Institute of Child Health in London as well as, a uh, as additional specialist clinical training in prestigious hospitals across the breadth of the UK. Uh, she has the um, fellowship of the Royal College of uh, Pediatrics and Child Health, and she's a consultant neurodevelopmental pediatrician at the Queen Elizabeth II Hospital in Welland Garden City in Hertfordshire in the UK, soon approaching 20 years. Uh, Dr. Takam was fascinated about how to improve the quality of assessment and care with respect to mental health and psychiatric comorbidities within the population of children and young people um, on her caseload of um, individuals who have neurodevelopmental disorders and uh, neurodisability. This prompted her again to undertake an MSc in clinical neuropsychiatry at Birmingham, where it's no surprise that the dissertation title was ability of children aged six to 10 years with tics and Tourette syndrome to report premonitory urges. Uh, Dr. Taka has been trained in delivering some of the uh, behavioral therapies regarding tics, and I'm sure she'll be discussing that with us today. She provides training to doctors and other health professionals on tic disorders and also on other neurodevelopmental disorders. Dr. Takon has co-authored a book titled ADHD, Ticks and Me. And she has also ventured into the public world of media doing a BBC TV short documentary on ticks. So I'm sure that you'll all agree with me that she has all the um, credentials to be the speaker for today's session. I could say so much more about um, Iyang, but uh, I feel confident that her presentation will speak for itself. Uh, she assures me that the presentation on ticks isn't about the blood sucking um, uh, ticks that <laughs> hang out on cattle. Um, and when I try to inquire that, how about the TikTok revolution? Uh, she was a bit cagey about that bit, but it, uh, my suspicion is that she might bring in something about TikTok into today's presentation. She has 45 minutes for her presentation, after which she will take questions. And I'd encourage individuals to uh, please post their questions into the chat menu, and then we can take those at the end of the presentation. I'll now hand over to Iyang. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Kunli. Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? Can you all hear me? Loud and clear. Yes, okay. Loud and clear. <laughs> okay. Compliments okay. of the season to everyone, my teachers, senior colleagues. I can see so many of my bosses and teachers and senior colleagues and colleagues here. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to talk to you today. Uh, I now know why Sandy was adamant for me presenting today because he, as I used to call him an efiko, he was <laughs> determined to make sure that he ended the year doing this talk without breaking schedule. So well done, Sandy. Um, and thank you for giving up your time, everyone, to listen to this today. I'm going to try and make it as practical as I can. Um, and thank you, Kunde, for the introduction. Um, thank you very much. It's lovely to know somebody who I've known from medical school um, being here as well. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. But I want to make the talk practical because sometimes it's quite it's quite tempting when doing these talks to go very um, theoretical. And I'm a very much practical, pragmatic person to see what can we do in our environment as I remain quite keen on the fact that we can always do you know, adapt things in our in our environment to suit our local practice. So some of the things I will talk about today is to help us think about what can we do um, when helping children within our environment with this condition. So I'll start by sharing my screen, um, hopefully. Can you all see that? Yes. Okay. So um, I'm just hoping that at the end of this, we'll be able to get two, at least two things out of this. Um, one, to improve the awareness of how to assess and manage children with tick disorders. And two, to highlight the role of collaborative working in improving outcome for children with tick disorders. And I think we'll get to the reason why I've highlighted that second bit, because we will realize as we go on that actually the child with ticks is um, in different environments. And if we don't address what happens in other environments where the child spends most of his or her day, we're not going to be able to support that child well. I'll start with um, some case histories, which I, you know, the way children are referred to us and some of the things on the referral letters. So when we get referrals from um, the doctors to see children, they come with very few um, statements and the rest is usually left for us to, to work out what could be going on. So this first case is a, a six-year-old who developed recent eye-blinking episodes. He was head jerking and mouth um, twitching as well. And it had been over the last three months, but these episodes were occurring more at home than at school. Now, Jay's friends had also noticed the episodes and had asked him why he was making these movements because they were curious. He was always twitching his mouth and doing all these movements that they were seeing. So, Parents were obviously very anxious and worried because this was becoming um, more common. And obviously as a parent, you don't know what's happening, anything mouth, neck, they're worried, is there something going on in his brain? So he was referred to the doctors and the GP had mentioned that there was nothing in his birth and developmental history. And that was the same when he was seen by the doctors. So, you getting this referral and saying JA, you've seen JA in the clinic, um, you're obviously thinking about um, different things. And I just um, wondered, it would be, I know we've got short, a short time, but it would be, be important to think about what would you be considering when you've got this kind of referral? Because there are several things that could be going on through your mind. I just wondered if we could get like two responses and what people were thinking. So we've got mouth twitching, jerks, eye blinking. Can you there's someone responded in the chat? Any? Well, well, with me, I would think that maybe this is just a physical condition. 
I wouldn't be thinking of tick disorder. Okay. Thanks. And when you say physical condition, what do you mean? What what kind of physical condition would you be thinking about? Well, um, I wouldn't be specific, but uh, I would just think that uh, possibly yeah, the, the, the child is just developed in a neurological uh, condition, and mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't be very specific on that. Okay. okay. And that's so, good. So you'd be thinking, could this be neurological? And, and yes, there are some signs there that would make you think that. So thank you. Is there another response, can I? Yeah, so within the chat, we've got um, we've got ticks, we've got focal seizures, we've got ticks or seizures, we've got myoclonic seizures, and we've got SOL, which I assume that the uh, person means space occupying lesion. Yeah. Okay. Good. So we'll, 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 the, the talk will bring some of this to light, but it's good to see how, you know, we're looking at the referral, we're already thinking about differentials. And this is another girl. She's a 12 year old who has had longstanding anxiety concerns. She has some obsessive compulsive symptoms, but she's been functioning very well. But recently she developed sudden onset neck jerking, shoulder shrugging, throat clearing, squeaky noises, and blurting out inappropriate words. And they increased in frequency. They were present at home and school. These episodes were impacting on her schoolwork and her relationship with her peers. Again, before we go to the management, what are people thinking here? Okay, possibly similar. I'll go to the third one so that I'm just conscious of the time. And this is an interesting one. So she's a 16 year old girl. She's been well previously, nothing, no problems at all. She had normal birth and developmental history, no, some difficulties with friendships when she moved to secondary school. Then she developed anxiety and panic attacks in secondary school. And this, she did have some school refusal pre-pandemic, pre-COVID. And then when she got back to school, she was noted to have motor and vocal tics. They became worse when she was outdoors and at school than at home. And sometimes they would last up to five to 10 minutes. And sometimes she would appear quite vacant and confused after these episodes. And this is an interesting one that I would just want to find out what people are thinking. What do you think in this girl who she'd been fine, no problems before, and then afterwards she developed these movements, which became worse after the pandemic. Any ideas? And just out of interest, are we seeing children presenting this way to our clinics in, in Nigeria, in Africa? Please, any responses? Uh, so far, not okay. We've got one now. Um, we've got uh, drugs and sexual abuse. Perhaps, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Chukwunyu might want to expand on that a bit. We've got post traumatic stress, um, we've got Rett syndrome. Well, that's what it, that's the person says for the second case. So we'll stick with the current case that we're talking about for the time being. Uh, we've got long COVID neurological sequelae. And so I think the chat is quite active now regarding that. So I'm sure okay. you'll be able to condense all of these. So quite interesting and quite interesting um, and appropriate differentials for um, a lot of them. So we'll just go into our talk. So when we talk about tick disorders, most times we're referring to kind of what we mean by what the, you know, the primary tick disorders, but we will talk about other um, conditions where ticks can occur. So when we refer to a tick, it's a sudden, it's sudden, it's um, rapid recurrent, it's non-rhythmic motor movement, or you can have vocalization. So it's, remember, it's quite sudden and um, it happens very quickly, very short as well. 
and it happens rapidly as well. So there are a spectrum of conditions and they can vary from being very mild to being a combination of um, tics, which we will be talking about, which includes motor and vocal tics. So tics can be either simple. So when it in involves only a few muscle groups, so one, either one or a few muscle groups. So for example, your eye blinking, it's just using one group of muscles and, and you describe that as a simple tick. Or if you have your neck jerking, it's just one group of muscles. So when it when it involves just a few muscles or just a, a, a simple sound like a throat clearing or, um, you know, uh, sometimes you can have other simple sounds, just straightforward sounds, you call that simple ticks. But where it has multiple groups of muscles recruited, so some ticks you might have um, more complex movements. So you don't just have the neck jerking, you have shoulder movements, or you can have jumping, or you can have twisting or turning. So you're recruiting more muscle groups to actually produce that sequence of movement. Or with the vocal ones, you can have um, several sounds or evolving into sentences or phrases, then you call that complex uh, tick. So it can either be simple or complex. Now, I, I wanted to show you just a bit of what a few ticks look like on this video. And hopefully, I just hope it works. Um, I will see if it works. It's just, I'm just going to go straight. Can you hear? It's Rowena Merritt. I am 17 turning 18 and I have Tourette syndrome. My name is I just want to, I'm showing this just to see whether you can recognize some of the ticks in these videos that the children are doing. So I had tried to see whether I could find anyone with children locally, but I couldn't. Can you hear at all? There's no video display from- No this video? Thing. No. Oh dear. I don't know if others can see it. Can anybody see a video? Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll just go back to the presentation. Not yet. You didn't see the video. Okay, I'll try later. Mm -hmm. So ticks can either be primary ticks. I could see the video. I don't know why it wasn't showing, um, but we'll just continue. Ticks could be primary ticks. So the ticks we are talking about, the, um, the, the simple motor vocal ticks we're talking about, which arise without any cause and just start spontaneously, um, those ones are primary ticks. But you can ha also have ticks arising from different conditions. So infections, um, encephalitis, streptococcal infections, or medication, substance use, head traumas, toxins. You can have ticks occurring in that condition, in those situations, but in those cases, the ticks are secondary um, as opposed to primary. They're secondary to the cause, to the infections. But you would know that, you know, when you take your history, you'd be able to um, go and ex you'd be able to explore a lot more of these uh, causes. But children with primary ticks are generally well children developing, most of them developing well. We say that, although it can occur in children with um, neurodevelopmental disorders as well, who are um, developing well and then develop these movements. So a bit about the epidemiology. So we know that um, ticks on its own, there's a, a variation in the epidemiology depending on what you are talking about. We know that we can have uh, prevalence for Tourette syndrome, which is quite different, which we will talk about um, Tourette being 0.5 to 1. But if you're talking about transient tick disorders or proportional tick disorders, which last less than a year, you have many more children having this. So if you go into a lot of schools, you probably see lots of children having one or two of these movements. They're blinking, they're 
shrugging their shoulders, they're moving their heads, it's not bothering them. And the duration would be um, as short as, you know, a few months, but less than a year. And a lot of these children are functioning absolutely well with no problem. So you find uh, the prevalence in, in that uh, population is higher. Now, when you have children who've had ticks lasting longer than a year, so in the past, they used to be called chronic motor ticks if it's lasted um, up to a year for the motor ticks, then you have the prevalence being different. So it can be 0.3% in those that have lasted up to a year for just the motor ticks or 0.2% for just the vocal ticks um, lasting up to a year. So the prevalence varies. But for Tourette syndrome, it's roughly about 0.5 to 1%. As in most neurodevelopmental conditions, males are uh, affected more than females. Um, for prevalence in some places is about 4 to 1, some about 3 to 1, but on average it puts it about 3.6 to 1. What we do know is ticks are very common um, in families, highly um, heritable. So we know that um, if a child comes with a tick, it's, it, it's likely that there is a family member with a tick. And what's very, what we usually find in clinics sometimes is, you know, the child is there having the ticks and you can see the parents as well um, having their ticks. And without them, actually, most parents would not have known they have ticks because it may not have been bothering them. But you being the clinician, um, seeing and asking, and it's interesting, sometimes you ask the question, is there a family history of ticks? And the parents say no, but you're seeing them ticking away and having their ticks, um, eye blinking and having several ticks going. It's because a lot of us have ticks, which doesn't bother us. And that's the, um, you know, the important thing about learning about ticks is that not every tick is severe enough to need treatment. It only becomes a disorder when it has become impairing and is impacting on that child. And we'll talk about that as well. So again, this just highlights who develops ticks. Um, there isn't a single gene that is heritable um, that you can say when you have that gene means that you're going to pass it on to your family. There's ongoing research. There's lots of research still going on. Some genes have been identified, but what they've seen is that there's a cluster of genes that are commonly seen in um, in people with ticks. And when they've studied, they found that their family members have those cluster of genes. And those cluster of genes are also common in people with obsessive compulsive disorder. And hence it's not, um, it, it's not surprising that when you have ticks, you have a lot of the people, the affected children or adults having comorbid obsessive compulsive disorder or some of those other disorders that we'll talk about. It may form part of a, uh, maybe seen in neurological conditions. We've already talked about where they can occur. Now, I was doing a literature search and trying to find out how, whether we have ticks, uh, you know, whether we've got reported, um, you know, prevalence. And I couldn't really find um, literature on ticks in Africa. There were a few case reports. Um, mm -hmm by that I found um, and what this the summary from this case is they reported two cases one child ended up being an inpatient in a hospital from quite severe tics and was treated with um, a cocktail of medications and what the um, author summarized was that tics in Africa um, were underreported underdiagnosed and there were other problems with social isolation for the people affected. So people felt some form of stigma when they had ticks. So it's not surprising that many of these children probably are not coming up to light to the clinics. There was poor awareness. There were problems with actually how to get a diagnosis. And so financial constraints, so there were all kinds of problems that existed within those two cases that were reported. Um, so it just means that are we, meet, are we not seeing them? Are we seeing them or not diagnosing them properly? Um, it just raised a lot of food for thought for us. And I think this is one of the practical things that I want us to take out because we know that ticks are not just 
um, something that happens in one part of the world and doesn't happen in others. It is present. When I think back, I can think about people I've met, um, I've come across who have tics, but I didn't know there were tics then uh, um, in the early part of my training. So I think that it, it's something that is present in our community and we should be looking out for. So in terms of definition, we use the DSM-5 and tick disorders, again, that we've talked about um, lasting less than one year are now referred to as provisional tick disorder. They used to be called transient in DSM-4. And when they go on longer than one year, they're called persistent, um, used to be called chronic. So if you've got just the motor ticks um, lasting longer than one year, it's called persistent motor tick disorder. And if you've got, if you've got vocal ticks that lasted longer than one year, it's called persistent vocal tick disorder. Now, Tourette syndrome is actually just a tick disorder. It's nothing more than a tick disorder. It doesn't mean that when you have Tourette's, you have a more severe tick disorder. Tourette's is just a description of a tick disorder. That means you have multiple motor tick disorder ticks coexisting with vocal tics that have lasted longer than one year. It doesn't mean you have more severe tics. So people get afraid and worried, oh, I've got Tourette's, that means I must have a serious condition. No, it just means you've got both motor and vocal tics. They've been occurring relatively, very frequently, almost every day for longer than one year. And that's, and that's what you call Tourette's. So multiple motor and vocal tics present for at least one year, not attributable to a medical cause or substance use and onset before 18 years of age. So um, saying that, um, it was very interesting when I was doing my MSc that the lecturer who taught us on one of our modules on Tourette syndrome developed Tourette in later life. And he was having these tics in the classroom. So we learned a lot about tics from him. He developed it much later. Although the literature says onset before 18, some people have developed it later. So what happens in the brain in tics? Why do tics occur? It's been thought that, it put it in simple terms, brain networks are immature or sometimes abnormal. And this is what parents want to know when they come to you. They're asking, why do my, why is my child doing this? Why is my child having this movement? And they get worried. Is there something in the brain? You know, can this be cured? What, when is it going to stop? So you as the clinician needs to be able to provide these responses and be able to talk to them about, you know, literally you, you have to be able to give them some answers and reassure them in most cases, um, because we know that most cases you don't have to do anything more than reassure them, but actually going through the process of letting them understand why the child is having that. So in terms of etiology, just taking us back to a little bit of neuroanatomy, um, we know that if we look at our brains, we can divide it into the upper brain and the lower brain, uh, or the midbrain. And we know that the upper brain is doing a lot of, um, you've got a lot of uh, radiation and networks connecting the upper brain and the lower brain. And we've got what we call the cortical striatal thalamocortical circuit and it looks a bit like that so if we look at our brain the frontal loop we've got different parts of the frontal loop and those different parts of the frontal loop are responsible for different things so they're the parts that are doing more about your motor function and there are parts that got more um emotional components to it but if you look at this it's got lots of networks so you've got things going from the upper part to the striatum, to the thalamus, to the amygdala. And what you find is for your movements to be smooth and things to work smoothly, those networks are fine-tuned. Now, if there's any um, abnormality or disruption, um, then you have what you call, it's almost like you have release of these movements not being smoothened out. And that's what been thought to have in um, happening ticks. So I'm trying not to make it very complex, um, but just to say that the upper brain needs to smoothen movements through these networks. And when those networks are not working very well, then you have um, abnormalities and you have your ticks happening. And that's why some of the treatment modalities that are being developed in terms of 
managing quite severe tics involves things like deep brain stimulation, where people are trying to reach into those deeper structures to actually um, help with managing tics that are not responsive to the usual management. And also we know that people with tic disorders have um, emotional component and they have problems with anger, sometimes rage, and there's the emotional component. And all that is linked to all these networks that are going on in the brain. So our brain, very important, but just for the point of this lecture, just knowing that these are the areas that are important in ticks. So it's also found that the um, dopaminergic pathways is implicated. And although you have other neurotransmitters, Dopamine is one of those being implicated in tick disorders. Um, and some of the treatments that have been used are using those um, pathways to, to manage it. Okay. Now, when do people tend to develop ticks? So typically children develop ticks around age four to six years, um, five to six. And they tend to peak at about age 10 to 12. So it starts early childhood, peaks at about 10 to 12. And we know that by adolescence, about two, two thirds will be better. Just one third continues to have ticks after uh, adolescence period. So typically that's what you tend to get. So about 10 to 12, you tend to get them having their ticks at their worst. Now, ticks do not remain the same in the same child. You might have one child having one tick one minute, then it changes. And if you're in clinic, you might find the parents saying, oh, he now has this new tick, he has this new one. They keep telling you about different ones. What we do know again is that most times the motor ticks tend to precede the vocal ticks. So ticks tend to start onset from the top and go downwards. Um, but there are times when we've had children who just had vocal ticks and that's all they've had. And some you know, that process has not followed that pattern. And when we talk about motor tics, these are some of the movement you can get. And vocal tics, you can, we've talked about some of them, simple ones, throat clearing, squeaky noises. You might just see the child sitting in a corner making squeaky bird noises and parents get frustrated trying to tell them to stop and they can't stop. The child may sometimes repeat their words or repeat your own words or blot out phrases. This is what people usually think the child is swearing. And for a long time, people thought, oh, if anybody swears, then they must have Tourette's, no. So people who have Tourette's do not deliberately swear at people. And it's only 10% of people with Tourette's syndrome who actually have this blotting out of phrases or this kind of swearing, what people call swearing. They're not deliberate swearing. So if somebody brings a child to you and says, this child is swearing a lot and must have Tourette, then you have to you know, um, take a, a history because what, what the, the children who have Tourette's do is they blot out these phrases. They might have heard them from somewhere. Um, I remember in my class again with my lecturer, being a lecturer of very good standing, he was blotting out these words randomly in the classroom um, of, you know, clinicians. And we were, you know, well, it, it actually helped us to be that close to somebody with Tourette's and actually know that this were just, you know, part of the spontaneous um, involuntary phrases that just come out in ticks. So when this, when the children come to you, what, do you do as a clinician? Um, obviously, you take your very good history, um, developmental history, um, birth history. Um, from the from the mother, you're going to you know to get a very good uh, prenatal history, including use of drugs and alcohol um, in pregnancy and any other substances. So you get a very good history, but you also get the onset and cause of symptoms because if a parent comes and tells you that my child developed these movements at one year or before one year or two years, you know that that's actually not what you expect to get with tick disorders. So it's very important to know how tick, when they occur, and the pattern, because there's several movements that children have, um, one of which is 
motor stereotypies, which people confuse a lot with tics, which actually can start early and which you tend to find in a lot of children with um, neurodevelopmental disorders like autism. So if a parent tells you it has tics, but they started nine months, one year, then you know actually that's not really fitting a pattern of tic disorders. She's probably talking about something else. You have to assess whether they are motor and vocal tics and you have to screen for the comorbidities, which we will talk about. And you have to do a very detailed neurological examination. It's so important to do a neurological examination because just as we're saying that, you know, with tics, they're quite primary and simple. You can actually have neurological conditions that can present with tics. And it's in those conditions that you are now going to go and do further investigations. So with children with just simple tics and all that, you don't need to do any scans, but it's your neurological examination that will be able to determine whether you need further investigation. So if you see a child blinking and all that, you don't need to do scans, but you need to do a proper, proper neurological examination. Now we've talked about comorbidities and if you just look at this nice um, circle um, and, and picture, you see lots of things that can happen in children with tics and Tourette syndrome. And so your assessment for seeing a child with tic disorders does not stop at just finding out about the tics. You have to ask questions, not, you're not going to be assessing them yourself for all this, but you need to explore whether the child has any of these other additional features. Because a lot of times, many children with tics will have at least one comorbidity that needs further assessment. So it's so important that when you see that child, you screen for all these other things um, by asking questions um, and just then knowing where to signpost the child to. So comorbidities are quite common in patients with tic disorders. And we know that about 40 to 60% of children with tics have ADHD which if you don't ask, you will not find, you will not, you know, you will not be able to get the answer, but most of them will, you know, a lot of them will have the, even when people haven't identified it, many people, many of them will have obsessive compulsive disorder. Some may just have behaviors, not enough to make the diagnosis for the disorder. Mood disorders, anger, rage, and aggression are also quite common. Now I put this here because it's not uncommon for children with tics to present in other clinics and being treated for other things when they've had just tics. So respiratory is one of the commonest ones. We see children who are presenting with in quote allergy cough and they're given all kinds of medications which the, the cough still doesn't subside. And they keep, they, they, they keep treating them. And some of these children, and we've certainly seen some who have ended up having um, vocal tics and have been you know, managed and felt better. Some of them might have behaviors where they're touching themselves or doing other things that could be considered quite dangerous and, um, and have been um, taken down safeguarding route. So it's important. This is just some of them, they present in different um, specialties. So it's important to make sure that we are, um, we are assessing them properly. Now, I'm not going to go into the acute tics today, but we do know that um, some children can develop tics acutely. And likewise, we also know that there are children with just tic disorders where parents feel that there is a, an acute concern or something that's treatable. And so we do sometimes get parents asking for extensive investigations, even when we know that the child just has a primary tick, um, but parents want post treptococcal you know, thinking about pandas, which is, you know, the, um, the, the um, pediatric uh, neuropsychiatry symptoms following streptococcal infections. So as clinicians, we should be able to explore from the history, and you would know whether this is an acute illness or chronic illness? Was there any acute symptom before that? How soon after did the child have tics? Talking about pandas is another big topic on its own, so I'm not going to go into that, but just to know as clinicians, being able to explore whether you were talking about an acute or a chronic episode, and we've talked about uh, comorbidities. One of the key things that's very good, which parents do now, and they've been doing it for epilepsy, but we're finding it very useful for tics, is for parents to record 
when the child is doing ta the takes and bringing it to you because sometimes they struggle to describe it and it's not unusual that the child might be with you in the clinic and may not be able to um, will not show that they're having tics at all um, but when the parents record these episodes and bring them to you it's very very useful so what that's one of the pr practical things that you can do in your clinic um, phones are very much available. Parents can record it and bring it. Now, um, we have some forms that we use which parents complete. Um, so when I see children with ticks, we ask them to complete a form called the Yale Global Tick Severity Scale. It helps them to itemize all the ticks. So even ticks that parents do not remember, um, the questionnaire has a way of listing all the ticks there and the parents can tick whether they were present before, whether they're current and the severity. And it helps you to work out how severe that child's ticks are. We also have this um, scale um, and I'm going to talk about premonitory urges um, because that was also the title of my dissertation, but we use this scale. I think before that, I'll just talk about what premonitory urges are. So if I do a little exercise for you now, and if I say to everyone, just keep a straight face, look at me and don't blink until I say you should blink and just try doing that. I know I'm not in the room with you, but just try opening your eyes wide, looking straight at me and not blinking um, and keep that going for, I mean, usually we keep it going for longer. What you do find, um, is we don't have enough time to do this, but what you do find is you're trying very hard to keep your eyes open. And at a point you start feeling, you know, some sensations um, above your eye. You want to blink, but you're staring. Sometimes you might be using methods of even staring more to keep the um, movements away. And you're staring even more to keep the movements away. Now at a point, there's a give where, you just feel, I can't hold this anymore. I just have to blink. And you get this sense of relief afterwards that, oh, that's so, that's so good. Or another example is you're sitting in a professional meeting. You have an urge to really scratch your hand. You're feeling this itch and you want to scratch, but, you can't, but you're sitting in this meeting and you just have to keep it going and you don't want to scratch, but you know it's there. You That urge is building and building and building. It's there and you might just give in and scratch their hand and then helps you because until you actually get rid of that itch, you are not, um, you are not able to concentrate fully. And that is what it is like for children with tick disorders. They have this urge that they just feel if they don't do something, they're going to burst. And that the tick itself is the outcome of that urge. So the urge is the much more um, uncomfortable part, but when they do the movements, it's a relief from those urge. So that's why they keep doing it. And unfortunately it doesn't go away, it just keeps going in circles um, and they have to do it. So. When we want to look at how they are with their premonitory urge, we ask them questions to find out how intense the urge is, because finding out about this urge is the basis for when you want to deliver behavioral management programs for ticks. If a child doesn't describe their premonitory urges, you, you would struggle to deliver the behavioral management, because what you are working on is the premonitory urge rather than the tick itself. When you help them control the premonitory urge, you can reduce the tick. So um, when I did my study um, before, the reason why I did this study be was because children could not access um, children, the, the Great Ormond Street team who were doing therapeutic management for children with ticks, were only doing it from 10 years upwards. So children younger than 10 could not access that because they said they couldn't describe the premonitory urges. And that was the reason why I decided to study children six to 10, to actually speak to the children and get them to describe what they felt when, you know, when they were having this movement. And this, this, is, this was an eye opener because children, we think they can't describe things, they really can. Um, and these were some of the responses from some of the children. 
Um, some of them said it feels really tight that they try to put their hands by their side, they talk in their legs, they get this intense sensory urges. And you can imagine this child sitting in the classroom trying very hard to imagine a child who's being teased about their tics and they're trying very hard to control their tics, but they're feeling very uncomfortable. Teacher doesn't know, probably shouting on them. Um, but these are some of the descriptions. Some of them said it felt quite, they felt stiff and wriggly and itchy. They were fidgeting and wriggling on the chair. Um, some of them said they couldn't stop um, tapping their ankle. Um, some said, I want, you know, they were talking to the tics, um, some felt it, it really distracts them from what they were doing. It's so annoying. So there's a lot of discomfort children get um, when, they, when they feel these urges. So when do tics occur? Anytime. But a lot of times when the child is relaxed or doing activities requiring less effort, they may do tics. We do know that Ticks are less frequent when they're doing something that's more engaging. So sometimes we, one of the things that we ask school to do is keep them engaged or parents, you know, if, if you feel the child is doing um, the ticks a lot, sometimes you, you, you can get them to be doing an activity and the ticks will reduce at that time. What triggers the development of ticks? Some, sometimes stress, anxiety, um, overexcitement, environmental change there are different times some children a lot of children have takes a lot when they're stressed um, or, or overstimulated what happens um, with the families it's resulted in lots of arguments even between parents about you know, one of the things parents sometimes do is tell the child, stop doing the ticks, stop doing the ticks. And what happens when you tell the child who's got ticks to stop doing it, they do it more because ticks are very suggestible. So if you have somebody with ticks and you say, stop it, they will do more of it. So the first thing we teach parents to do is avoid telling the child to stop it. School, it can affect them academically and they can be bullied by friends. Um, and so they have difficulty with friendships and also their own self-esteem. So it's so important. So should all children with ticks be referred? No, most children with ticks are happy. They're not bothered. So parents should not get worried if the child is not really bothered by it and seems happy and confident, you don't need to be worried. And that's what we can do as clinicians. We can reassure those parents. Many children do not need active intervention. What is important is the psychoeducation. So when you improve awareness and understanding between the parents and the families, then you'll be able to, uh, within the parents and the schools, you are doing a big support for that child, actually, much more than some of the treatments that you would be giving. But children who are referred are the ones with impairment from their disorder. So again, we said, not every tick is a tick disorder, but when that tick is affecting that child, so for example, is affecting them doing their work at school, writing, it's affecting them, you know, everything they want to do, the tick is affecting them, they can't do what they, then you know there's impairment and they need to be referred. And when do you worry? If they're having injuries from the ticks, so they're hitting themselves, they're having bruises. We've seen children with huge bruises from ticks. Some hit their chest and really hit hard. Some fall. Um, some have real bad neck pains. We've had children with really bad neck pains and emotional and mental health. Sorry, I'm going to be speeding from here. I know I don't have much time. Um, so you get worried when the ticks are severe and persistent enough to distress the child or interfere with their learning, or that child is becoming increasingly anxious with low self-esteem. And I've certainly seen some children express this very well. Um, it can affect their mood behavior. And um, so we come to the management of ticks. And, um, I will talk about functional ticks um, in a bit, but I will come to the management. So management of ticks, um, primary ticks we're talking about now. Remember we said we have secondary and primary ticks, but I'm talking about primary ticks. Psychoeducation is really important. There are lots of resources online, but I think that for our environment, we should think about developing even simple things that can be easily accessible or understood by our population to understand 
um, ticks. Environmental modifications, this is important, especially with the schools. What can the teacher do? So if the teacher sees the child is having lots of ticks, they can give that child breaks in the classroom, get them to walk around, walk about, um, get them to do things to reduce that, give them a break, let them step out of the class a bit. So this is where we as clinicians can advise the schools. And then there is this structured behavioral therapy for ticks and then medication. So we can see medication is low, low, low down the line. We see cases where lots of children are put on cocktails of medication. One of the primary things we have to remember is that the aim is not to abolish every tick the child has. In fact, the aim is not to abolish ticks if the ticks are not bothering the child. So what I learned from my lecturer then was that he came into the classroom and he wasn't having any ticks at the time. So we didn't think he had ticks, you know, we'd been warned he had ticks, but we thought, oh, he's fine. Then as he got more relaxed, he started having the ticks. And then he asked us the question, why do you think I did not have ticks at the beginning? And we thought, oh, we don't know where you said. He said, well, he was very anxious. And he did not, he was not sure of our class. So he was trying very much to suppress it, but he was very tense and very distressed. So as he became more relaxed, he was having more ticks. But if somebody sees him at that time, somebody would think that his ticks means he's got very severe Tourette's. So having a lot of ticks does not mean your, your Tourette's is very severe. You have to look at is that child relaxed? Is he happy? Is he okay with it? And that determines your management plan. So one of the key things and the practical things I wanted to bring out today is that it's important to support parents meet with this child's teachers to talk about the ticks. Teachers should be supported with strategies to manage ticks in the classroom. And clinicians, we can help provide that information to parents to pass on to the teachers. And we can, we can promote relaxation activities, give them breaks as well. Now, in terms of, um, sorry, I'm just, how many minutes do I have, Polly? Five minutes. Okay, I'm going to just speed through. So differential diagnosis. We've talked about some of them in those early um, in those early case histories. Case history one and two um, had tick disorders. Um, trem myoclonus, you can have movements that are rapid than brief movement, but they're more rapid than the brief movements in, in ticks. They do not have premonitory urge. So one of the classic distinguishing things for tick disorders, primary tick disorders, is to ask about premonitory urges ask the child and the premonitory urges are not one. So if the child is having an eye blinking tick, ask them, do you have a sensation before you blink? If they're moving their neck, do you have any feeling before you move your neck? If they're having vocal tics, do you have any feeling before you make these sounds? So you, that's one key thing that helps you to distinguish normal primary tics from other movements. Tremors, they're more oscillatory in the particular body part. Dystonias, they don't have premonitory urges and um, they cannot be suppressed. Now, the thing about ticks is that although they are um, um, involuntary, you can have a voluntary component. So you can temporarily suppress it by recognizing the urges. And that's what you use in the behavioral management, which I will touch on briefly. Seizures, somebody had mentioned seizures for one of the differentials. Movements in seizures cannot be suppressed. There are no premonitory urges, and you might have real impairment in consciousness. Obsessive compulsive disorder, they tend to have more of an inner anxiety, and it's that anxiety that makes them begin to do the things they do. So they begin to touch, check things, and arrange things because of the inner anxiety. And then one of the common ones that we would be seeing, and I'm sure we probably see in our environment, is stereotypies. We see lots of children with stereotypies, movements that they're doing. It's a shame that the videos haven't worked, but I had some videos of stereotypies that they're purposeless movements. The child is just enjoying doing them. And this chart just gives us a difference between tics and motor stereotypies. So remember, if the child comes and parents are talking about this movement, if it happened before age three, then, you know, think about those movements, look at them on the video, 
and the usually motor stereotypies. With, with motor stereotypies, it's easier to distract the children from them. You can have comorbidities in both. But the difference with motor stereotypies is that the children enjoy it. They enjoy doing the movements. They are happy. Whereas the child with tics is very uncomfortable by the premonitory urges. So it's annoying. That feeling is so annoying to them, but they can't get rid of it. Whereas a child with motor stereotypies actually, you know, is enjoying what they're doing and they can, can keep doing it without being distracted. Now, functional tics, which we have been seeing a lot, and Dr. Yorinde mentioned the TikTok generation, is that over the, over the pandemic, there we've seen an increase in the number of children, a lot of them being girls, presenting with what looks like ticks. And we just had an explosion. We were having many of them coming to the clinics, presenting. And a lot of them had been, there are papers now that have looked at what was happening. A lot of children were, young people were copying these ticks on TikTok, on videos, mimicking them and perfecting them actually, so much that they could do them in this school. I remember having a girl in my clinic telling me half of the class were actually, you know, having ticks. A lot of them are teenage girls, a lot of them are anxious, um, what we've also found is that some of them have undiagnosed neurodevelopmental disorders, such as autism. Um, but be careful, classic tics and primary and functional tics can also coexist in the same child. But there's a high rate of misdiagnosis and treatment for children with functional tics. So the where these children, what they actually need is... Um, treating their anxiety or, or interventions for their anxiety, not treatment for their tics. Medication treatment for tics is not effective in this group. Um, so we've talked about investigation and that only when you think um, neurological examination is abnormal should you then go down the route of investigations and brain scans. Don't go doing that for each child. So we've talked about management, some part, um, and we've talked about medication is only used in children with disabling tics. I'm just going to touch on just a bit about the behavioral interventions. So what happens with behavioral interventions? Now, the research has found that a lot of the behavioral interventions are as effective as medication when they were researched. Uh, and there are two forms of the structured behavioral management. I'll just describe it briefly. The first one is habit reversal therapy. Remember I said that the premonitory urges is the key thing that we should be looking for when exploring because you are going to be using that premise of the premonitory urges as a basis for the child's management. So you get children to recognize the urge. Say for example, a child is having a tick on their neck and they keep moving their neck to the side, you know, because of the tick. You ask the child, if they feel a sensation before they do that tick, um, I'm sure you can see what I'm doing. You ask them, do you feel anything before you do the tick? And they say, yes, you know, I do. You get them to describe it. Now, through different, through subsequent sessions, you get them to each time they have that feeling, they do, you teach them a competing response. So if he's beginning to feel a sensation in his neck, instead, you get them to probably hold their neck in the opposite direction or straighten their neck and that feeling goes away. So that's what would have resulted in a tick, you know, eventually dissipates. So you're teaching them. It, it does take several weeks for them to actually master this, but this is the premise of habit reversal therapy. Um, you teach them a competing response. Now, the other one called exposure response prevention is quite similar, but you don't teach them a competing response. So they recognize the tick. You ask them again, do you feel a sensation before you move your neck? They say yes. Now you get them to try and hold on to that sensation. So whereas they would want to do the tick immediately, you get them not to do it. You, you set timers to say, okay, let's see whether we can hold that sensation for a minute longer, two minutes longer, three minutes longer. And that's the way you build on it so much that they can hold on to that urge for longer before doing, you know, and you find out that with time, 
the ticks actually abate. And that's the child learning that. That's called exposure response prevention. So medication, I'm not going to do too much about this because it's not, um, the, the, the goal is not complete elimination of the tick, but rather control of you know, the tick severity. And so we are not, the first thing we have to make clear to parents is that we're not giving medication to stop all the ticks. Um, if a child is having neck pain, you're just trying to relieve that or relieve things that are impairing. There are different medications. In the UK, we tend to use the alpha-2 adrenergic like clonidine, um, and sometimes we use guanfansin if the child has ADHD. We don't tend to go straight for the neuroleptics because of the side effects. And really, we we I hardly use neuroleptics in my clinic, um, but the alpha-2 adrenergics like clonidine are quite good. Titrate it slowly, but you have to warn them of the um, um, side effects, the sedation and the drowsiness. And about prognosis, um, we've already talked about that takes most, a lot of children get it resolved by 18 years. Um, one third are symptom free, half mild ticks needing no treatment and one third persistent. If they have comorbidities, they might need multiple other drugs. So if they've got anxiety, they might have to have this with other drugs. And um, I just put this here as, a, as just a food for thought for us that having looked at the literature, there's very little, almost nothing on prevalence of tick disorders in Nigerian children. So for those who are trainees or um, doctors in studying or still interested in research, there's a lot for us to think about. We should think about local protocol for management of tick disorders in Nigeria. We should develop local psychoeducation material for children with tick disorders in Nigeria. We should think about how to communicate that to our, our population. There is a lot of useful resources for, um, you know, for managing ticks, family guide and things that are very relevant for families and professionals. There are websites um, with information. And that's the book that I published with a friend of mine, which is uh, with a colleague who, which is available on Amazon. Um, it's called ADHD Ticks and Me. And what I, we try to do here is actually breaking down the language for children to understand ticks. So explaining it in a story form about ticks while helping them get the understanding about tick disorders and, um, and what it means. I think I'll stop here um because i don't want to go on and on uh just i'm just going to stop here okay so, um sorry most children with ticks do not have impairment in their functioning schools can create supportive environment partnership partnership between parents and school is quite key any questions and Kunle, over to you <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. We would uh, welcome questions in the chat. Um, I'm sure you'd all like to um, congratulate uh, Dr. Takon on that very comprehensive um, run through on ticks and Tourette's. It's impossible to actually um, cover the entire topic in the short duration that she was given to, uh, to present the topic to us. Um, just a few, uh, whilst I'm just going to um, pick on a few things, whilst we're also waiting for um, questions from the chat, could I just ask you to kindly go back to the questions that you, the three questions that you've posed, and uh, for the benefit of those who might have joined a bit later, and to clarify on a few points there as to um, the conclusions from those, that'll be very helpful. Um, so some of the things that you did mention were about the terminology, about the um, what used to be called transient ticks, now provisional ticks, uh, um, in terms of the duration, weeks, months, and so on. You talked about um, what used to be chronic is now more persistent, and breaking it down into motor and also the vocal, some people call it verbal um, ticks also. And then when it actually does fulfill the criteria for a Tourette syndrome. And I was, I really liked the way that you emphasized the fact that, um, you know, that there isn't really anything that fundamentally is so um, magical about the term uh, Tourette's. 
um, other than the fact that it's time-based as well as um, a combination of both the multiple motor and um, also the, the vocal um, tics. Um, the, you mentioned also about the um, functional tics and just for the benefit of the um, audience, uh, I'll just suggest to people in their own time, if you put into your browser, TikTok ticks, um, you'll come across a whole range of different videos of functional tick disorders, mostly amongst young ladies who um, are very, some of them quite influential in having the followership um, uh, in bringing them out for ticks. Um, there was a mention also about the premonitory urge. And one of the uh, other descriptors is um, about individuals who might have, who might uh, have an itch or a sensation to sneeze, for instance, that until you've given an itch a good scratch, even if you've tried to ignore it, it doesn't always easily go away. Or until you've had that good sneeze, um, the sensation to sneeze will always be there until, un unless you're lucky to, to avert it. Um, just another uh, very helpful pointer that you did make was that distinguishing between ticks in isolation as well as ticks where there are comorbid neurodevelopmental disorders. And I particularly like the diagram that you showed, which included conditions such as anxiety disorders, ADHD, autism, um, and a whole range of other uh, disorders. Uh, and therefore, the importance also of probing as to whether those are also present, because as you might have alluded to, in some cases, they might be, some of the other um, co-occurring conditions might actually be predominant over the individual um, more than the ticks. Um, so we've now got the cases on the screen. So if you just like to... Um, talk everyone through. And before I forget, I'll just mention that um, even though I did have some, uh, we were a bit, you might have been a bit anxious at the start when there were maybe only about um, 10 of us and thinking what happens between Christmas and New Year, um, who wants to come and listen to you? But at the peak, you had about 77 people. So that's, again, uh, is a combination to, um, to, to, what, to, to what you had to offer to us this afternoon. If you, just, if you wouldn't mind just taking us through the cases very quickly okay. and then the conclusion. Thank you. Um, thank you, Kunli. I just want to say a lot of people got this right. So remember, we talked about epidemiology. So right age, six years. We said pick ticks tend to start about four to six. Eye blinking, head jerking, mouth twitching over the last three months. They seem to occur more at home than at school. So if two things might be happening here. He's very relaxed at home, so he's doing it more. At school, he tries to suppress it. Now, children are very clever. A lot of them actually develop their own coping mechanisms of, of um, suppressing tics in the classroom. So if you ask them, what happens when you're in class? Some will say, oh, I sit on my hands or I do certain things. So it's quite interesting. Some of them in in places, you know, outside outside home, they might be, you know, they might not say it more. Friends had noticed the episodes and it might be when he's actually relaxed with his friends, he's doing it more. Um, nothing birth and developmental history, no medication history. But parents were worried, you know, why is he having all this? Is there something wrong with his brain? So we've looked at a child who apparently has been normal, no problems at all. Examination was normal. So this looks like, you know, what we will call, um, you know, a, a simple tick happening in this child. What you need to find out when you are exploring this is how impairing is this for this child? 
So you're going to ask questions. You're going to get parents to, you know, you're going to explore this further through the history. You're going to ask the child about premonitory urges because until you hear from that child, you may not really know what is happening. And it's depending on what you find that you're, it's going to guide your management. But we know this child, you know, has a mototech um, possible disorder if it's impairing him somehow. But you need to find out and explore again for all these other comorbidities that we talked about. It's always important to find about them. You know, don't do a tick assessment without actually exploring about the comorbidities. So what you get, depending on where JA is with his symptoms, that's going to determine what you do. And I suspect that a lot of it will be psychoeducation, parent school, reassuring parents, don't worry, it's fine, nothing, you know, we don't need to do any investigations, and then information for school to support him. And, okay, and should, we quick, should we quickly take the case two? Okay. And just, just yeah. So this one, case two, is an interesting one who actually has um, anxiety, OCD behaviors. Um, now, if you look at her age, she's actually quite old um, to be developing the symptoms now. So the question is, was she having some before that parents didn't notice? And it's quite, it's not impossible that parents may not have noticed the subtle ones and that what is happening now, you should find out what is actually happening now that's making her having a lot more of this episode. Um, it's impacting on her schoolwork and her relationship with peers. So first of all, you want to, because you also have this, this child has longstanding anxiety concerns. You need to assess this child for a neurodevelopmental disorder. Is this child, does she have autism? You know, may, never know. Um, I'm just, I'm just summarizing because there are things you would need to explore to actually see, because this child may not just be a, a child having a tick, is there anything happening? Is there a neurodevelopmental disorder? Or could this still be a functional tick? You still have to have that at the back of your mind. So in again, doing this, I'm not giving straightforward diagnosis here. I'm actually guiding us as to how to explore this. For this child, she ended up having ASD. Um, she did have ticks, but she's had long-standing issues with severe anxiety and OCD as well. So although she did have ticks, but her more impairing symptoms was her ASD and her anxiety and her OCD. And that was what um, we've been managing more. Yeah. Uh, and thank you. And OCD being the obsessive compulsive, compulsive disorder, disorder and yeah. ASD being yeah. autism sorry, spectrum autism disorder. Spectrum. Yes, sorry, <laughs> Kumi, I've reverted into my mode. And then this one is one of the ones that um, we talk about where um, Kule was talking about some issues with the TikTok generation. Um, and this happened to be one of those girls who present um, with functional takes. And it, um, so, sorry, and just a moment. Can, can, can we kindly ask um, whoever it is to mute the microphone? Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Yeah, so this thank girl you. ended up having functional takes. Um, and again, we said that we had a lot of explosion after the pandemic. Um, because when she came in with those movements, again, one of the things that should guide you to looking at what are the tell to here? You shouldn't be having something that's a girl, she's 16, that is too late to be developing um, a primary take. Now she was fine before, but you can see a lot of anxiety. So she's already a girl that gets quite anxious. And then you can see that the movements were lasting five to 10 minutes. Um, that is too long for a take. So when you're seeing some telltale signs here, there's a lot of flags here that's not adding up to the pattern that you would expect with your usual takes. And that's where you begin to ask questions. And somebody mentioned, could this be post-traumatic stress? Could this be, you know, sexual abuse, safeguarding? All those are actually correct things to explore when taking a history from this 16 year old girl. Why is she showing all these features now? What could have happened to her that she's coming up with these behaviors now? Okay, uh, thank you very much. So. Uh, now, moving to the chat, uh, there's an overwhelming response of gratitude, uh, a lot of thank yous for the um, very good delivery and presentation. 
um, and um, people want to have the assurance that they'll have the opportunity to listen to you once again on the safe YouTube. And I think um, Dr. Litu has given that assurance. Um, there is a question that says, um, what is the role of brain stimulation? So, I mean, that's probably the deep brain stimulation in the management of ticks and Tourette's. So um, deep brain stimulation is actually one of those very, we would say quaternary <laughs> treatments for people who haven't um, responded well to, you know, cocktails of treatment, including different medications. And when they're severe, um, some centers, very few, um, actually, I think is one or two that offer deep brain stimulation. It's not something that's widely used, but there are other treatments that have been taught about. There's Botox that has also uh, botulinum toxin injections has also been tried. Um, there's cannabinoids that have been tried for uh, managing uh, ticks and Tourette's. I haven't gone into that because I've actually tried to just keep it at the practical management and looking at what we can do. But yes, there are other um, research and, you know, early treatment options, including this ones I've mentioned. So deep brain stimulation has been tried in, is being tried in some areas, but they're left for the very, very severe ones. Uh, thank you. Um, so we, we haven't had, um, it looks like your, your position has been so clear that we haven't had too many um, questions at this stage. Uh, but what I, I'm aware that we've got not just pediatricians in the house, but we've also got uh, psychiatrists within the house. So in your opinion, when uh, you have different medical specialties, uh, either uh, taking ownership or dominion or uh, uh, fighting over whose territory it should be, where do you think it lies? Um, in pediatrics or in psychiatry or um, the very uh, tactful and probably right approach of um, shared working with defined roles. Do I speak right for you? Yes, I think this is one of those conditions where we, and I think that's where I put um, as one of the objectives should be that collaboration, uh, partnership working in supporting the child with um, tick disorders. It is very important because as a clinician, you need to do the neurological bits. It's very important that every child that comes to you uh, with a disorder, tick disorder, you should do a neurological examination is good practice um, because one, you want to make sure that there's nothing else going on with that child. But if that child does have a, a comorbidity that is outside your remit as a pediatrician to treat, um, OCD, anxiety, depression, then you need your psychiatric colleague. So it's a shared, is a shared um, partnership in supporting the children. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, very stimulating talk. I have taken the liberty of uh, moderating of this um, this meeting to allow us to slip slightly in terms of time, but um, all good things must come to an end. And on that note, um, we will be ending the uh, the today's uh, oh. lecture, and Hello. I will Hello. be handing back Hello. to. Hello. Hello. Yes, hello. Is that, do we have a question yeah. there, a final word? Okay, yeah, yes, I have a question. Can we quickly take that and then we'll, we will then, uh, I'll. Um, okay. I, ju I just wanted to, 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 to understand the relationship between OCD and tick disorder. Uh, because uh, in our explanation, it was coming out frequently. So I just wanted to understand. Thank you. Okay. So, Obsessive compulsive disorder is the condition where you have, it's kind of an anxiety, a form of anxiety disorder, but you get intrusive thoughts, which then compels you to do several ritualistic activities. And it can involve um, the bits where you feel you need to close things or touch things or check things. So those ritualistic behaviors that you are doing is actually driven by an internal anxiety. So your anxiety is actually driving you to do that. So obsessive cleaning, obsessive this, you're doing that. 
Now, OCD is very common in children with tick disorders and Tourette syndrome. And what's also been found is that there are common genes that you find in children with Tourette syndrome, which you also find in people with OCD. They, um, so it's it's a comorbid. It's not um, it's not in the it's not a tick. It's different, but it happens a lot in people with tick disorders, and you should ask questions about it when you're assessing. Thank you very much. So um, on that Hello, final Kule, word, before you close, um, uh, just before you close, Kule, sorry. This uh, is uh, this now, is Gabriel this, this, Just a practical question. Okay. Because now, of uh, our uh, environment. Yeah, so, for timekeeping, this is now within the hands of Dr. Iletu and Dr. Lowell. But I can't not take you take your call. Thank you. All right, thank you. It's good to see you, Kule. But uh, what I wanted to ask, uh, of course, uh, clonidine and uh, guafacine are not available in Nigeria. Should um, we run into a case where we need to give um, a drug, a neuroleptic, what would be um, your suggestion in that situation? Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Professor Ofowe. I think um, my take is if I'm going to go outside my comfort zone, I usually send the child to the psychiatrist. So the because those drugs, the um, neuroleptics and all those other psychotropic drugs that you can use, they do come with lots of side effects and metabolic side effects that need a lot of monitoring. So my advice, um, which is what we practice here, is that if you're going to have to use any of those other medications, it's best to refer the child to a psychiatrist who is more comfortable with those drugs and will be able to, you know, be able to pick up side effects and reg um, manage them. So I tend to just stick to using those two combinations and if I need to if I think the child is not getting better and needs things like aripiprazole which we'll go through here um, we rarely use the haloperidol which is what some people use or risperidone but if the child needs that then I'll send to the psychiatrist. Thank you very much for your lecture. Thank, Thank you. you and, and Thank also you. to bear in mind the fact that uh, some of the neuroleptics also can induce their own movement yeah. disorders. Yeah. Um, and one of the advantages of medicines like guanfacin is that if there is comorbid ADHD, you can treat that at the same time. So um, thank you very much to Dr. Takon. Um, very stimulating discussion. And as you can see, people don't want to go. Um, a few days to the new year and you're still holding the attention of, uh, of, of the audience. So I'm, I'm sure that everyone would like to appreciate you in their own way. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone, and Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kunle, and uh, thank you, Yang. We've had a thank very, you very much. presentation today. Uh, I will land over to Dr. Mubalaji Lawal before we, we say goodbye. Well, just to wish everyone compliments of the season and a great 2023 ahead. Thank you all for making time out during the holidays to attend. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. And um, as I usually say, uh, Kule and uh, Yang, get ready for me. Don't worry. You, you know me. And for Dr. Bill, you should have shared some of these things with us, but uh, we, we saw you, Sha. Oh. <laughs> Thank uh, you very much. <laughs> Happy New Year to each and every one of us. Uh. Okay. Bye for now. Okay. God bless you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Femi. Bye bye. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Yeah.